Good evening, everybody. My name is Professor John Bynand, and I'm the Executive Dean of the wondrously named Faculty of Engineering, Computer, and Mathematical Sciences here at the University of Adelaide. I'd first like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the university's campuses at North Terrace, Roseworthy, Theberton, and Waite are built. Welcome everyone to tonight's Research Tuesday. As many of you already know, this is our wonderful series of free public seminars presented by the leading researchers at the University of Adelaide. This year, for the first time, the Research Tuesdays program is incorporating a series of inaugural lectures. These lectures are held to mark a major milestone in our researchers' careers, achieving the rank of full professor. Tonight, we welcome one of my own faculty's newest professors of mathematics, Finna Larison. Professor Larison began his career overseas, completing his undergraduate degree at the University of Iceland, and then a PhD in pure mathematics at the University of Chicago. Since that time, Finna has worked at universities in both the United States and Canada, before joining us at the University of Adelaide in 2006, nine years ago. Finna's research expertise is in the area of complex geometry, and he is a leading authority on the theory of ochre manifolds. His work is highly influential, and last May he presented a series of eight lectures at the invitation of the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, a great honor. He is also an outstanding teacher in the School of Mathematical Sciences, admired by his students and colleagues for his enthusiasm and clarity. And we will, of course, be relying on that heavily this evening. So would you please join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Finna Larison. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Good day, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it's good to, good to see so many people here. Uh, I want to thank Jessica Douglas and her colleagues in the Office of uh, Marketing and Communications for promoting the talk so effectively. Uh, the title was their idea. <laughs> I suggested some boring title like, What Do Pure Mathematicians Do? Uh, with that title, I'd probably have got 10 people. <laughs> so, um, in this talk, I want to um, introduce to you my discipline, Pure Mathematics and give you a glimpse of my own research. Pure mathematics has a reputation as, as an inaccessible subject, forbidding even. Many of the abstract concepts of mathematics are, are far removed from our daily experience. It takes years of study just to understand what they mean, let alone being able to use them. In pure mathematics, we reason about these concepts. And for the reasoning to be reliable, it must be very precise. So abstraction and precision demand a highly specialized vocabulary. So it's no wonder that, that there is an aura of mystery around pure mathematics in the minds of many people. So in the next hour, I would, I would really like to uh, uh, dispel a little bit of that mystery. I'll give you the short answer straight away. What is pure mathematics? Pure mathematics is mathematics for its own sake. So that means that the goal of pure mathematics is not to solve problems in other fields. Pure mathematics is mainly driven by its own internal forces. And yet, it turns out to be extremely useful. There are many, many, many examples of pure mathematics that was once considered entirely pure, entirely useless, finding important applications in other areas. And I'll give you three examples. Algorithms for web search engines use linear algebra. If you look on the web for information about some topic, 
using your favorite search engine, you'll typically get thousands of hits. So it's very important to, to have the most relevant hits at the top of your list. And today, search engines are very good at providing this, and they do it using algorithms that are based on linear algebra, the same linear algebra that we teach in our big first-year courses. Now, I don't think linear algebra was ever considered entirely pure. It has always had important applications. But this is a, a relatively new application that has become very important in our daily lives. Cryptography is my next example. When you buy something online and you provide your credit card number to the vendor or you send any kind of sensitive personal information over the web, it needs to be encrypted before it leaves your computer so no one other than the intended recipient can read it. The most commonly used encryption methods nowadays are based on number theory. Number theory is the field of pure mathematics that deals with prime numbers and things like that. It's not that many decades since number theory was considered the purest of pure mathematics. The third example I'll mention is tomography. In medical imaging and in geophysical research and exploration. So a CAT scan of an organ, say, gives us a cross-sectional picture of the organ indicating the density of the tissues within the organ. Areas of abnormal density can, can indicate disease or a tumor or something like that. So when we, when we do the CAT scan, we send beams of x-rays in many different directions through the cross-section. And the attenuation of each beam, the weakening, the dampening of the beam as it goes through the cross-section of the organ, gives us a measure of the total density of the organ along that ray. And from that information, it is possible to calculate the density of the organ throughout the cross-section. And this is done using a beautiful piece of pure mathematics called the Radon Transform. It was discovered by an Austrian mathematician named Johann Radon almost a century ago. It was published in 1917. As far as I know, Radon didn't have any applications in mind. Um, computer tomography, of course, was decades away. Uh, to him, it was simply a natural, interesting problem motivated from within pure mathematics. <coughs> It's normally impossible to tell whether a piece of pure mathematics will find applications later. But history has shown that the mathematical enterprise as a whole is profoundly useful and is indeed crucial to progress in, in science and technology. I wanted to make this point at the beginning, and now I won't say any more about applications. The job of the pure mathematician, what is it? It is to discover new truths about mathematical objects and their relationships. Such truths are established by proving them. It's only via proof that mathematical truth can be known to us. What is proof? Proof, let's say, is a complete and convincing justification. Now, couldn't that mean different things to different people, you might ask? Well, there has been general agreement on standards of proof among pure mathematicians for at least a century. I will give you examples later of modern abstract mathematical objects and proofs. Here's the first mathematician. Well, we're going back 2,600 years, so, so nothing is certain, but tradition has it that Thales of Miletus was the first to introduce deductive reasoning into mathematics. 
he realized that to establish a mathematical fact, we need to prove it. It's not enough to check that it holds in a hundred different examples. We need a general explanation that will cover all examples at once. <coughs> Thales is also called the father of science. He was the first, or so it's said, to seek rational explanations for natural phenomena without reference to mythology. Imagine what sort of progress that was. I want to show you three fundamental properties of pure mathematics that you might perhaps take as the definition of the discipline. Mathematics deals with mental objects created by humans. For example, we see pairs of things all around us. Two trees, two cats, two apples. From this we abstract the notion of the number two. But the number two exists only here, inside our heads. Still, these mental objects are so precisely defined that their properties do not depend on individuals, place or time. I can go to a different part of the world, or if I had a time machine I could go back in time, I could go back a century, and I could strike up a conversation with another mathematician about any number of mathematical concepts, prime numbers for example, and we could be sure that we'd be talking about the, the very same thing. And the third thing is that in pure mathematics we do not have permanent controversies about what's right or wrong. Yeah. When a mathematician proposes a new, intricate, complicated solution to some open problem, it may take the community some time to, to check the solution. But once it's been properly checked, there is no room for controversy. It's either right or wrong. This is very handy when you're marking homework. <laughs> These three properties come close to defining pure mathematics. If we look at neighboring disciplines like applied mathematics, theoretical physics, philosophy, I don't think you could say that, that any of these satisfies all three of these properties. I want to mention that my ideas on this slide have been influenced by a, a wonderful book called The Mathematical Experience by Philip Davis and Ruben Hirsch. I recommend this book uh, to anyone who wants, who wants a deeper insight into what mathematics is about. Let me go uh, in some more detail into, um, into a few characteristics of, of pure mathematics. I've already touched on hierarchy and technicality. Pure mathematics builds on ever-increasing prerequisites, and this is true in teaching as well. Uh, most of our third-year courses in pure mathematics, for example, are, they won't make any sense to you whatsoever unless you have uh, a good amount of second-year maths under your belt. I talked about the technical vocabulary. This makes pure mathematics relatively inaccessible to non-experts, I think more so than, than most other disciplines. Nothing is taken for granted, except a few actions. I, uh, we've just talked about the, the common standards of proof. But deductive reasoning has to start from somewhere. And, and Virtually all of modern mathematics can be, can be derived from only seven axioms. These axioms have been in place since the early 20th century, for about a century now, and they belong to the fundamental subfield of pure mathematics called set theory. So in a sense, all of mathematics is captured in half a page of Teasing it all out, of course, is a never-ending task. Unity. Just mentioned common foundations, common culture and standards of accomplishment. There's a lot of interaction between subfields of pure mathematics. Permanence of the literature is something that surprises experts in other areas. 
Uh, in my research, I routinely refer to and cite papers from the 70s, the 60s, even sometimes back to the 50s. Uh, I, I identified a couple of examples of this. Uh, I found a 50-year-old paper, a paper from 1965, with uh, 350 citations in the literature. Um, this, by the way, is a large number of citations for a paper in pure mathematics. Citation practices vary a lot between disciplines and even within a discipline. Um, in pure mathematics, we, we cite sparingly. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that half of the citations in the literature to this 50-year-old paper have come in the last 10 years. I also identified a book, found a book that was published 52 years ago. Uh, again, half of the citations in the literature to this book have come in the last 10 years. This may surprise some of you. Computers are not necessarily used in research in pure mathematics. Some pure mathematicians can put computers to good use in the research, but many, many cannot. When I'm juggling abstract objects, trying to see how, how they fit together, I'm not actually computing anything, and there is really nothing that a computer can do for me. Um, I'm not saying this is good or bad, this is just how it is. Okay, I promised you an example of an abstract modern mathematical concept. I'm going to tell you about the notion of a group. So what is a group? Well, if we look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, we see a number of related meanings. One of them is, maybe the basic one is, a number of things located or occurring in close proximity so as to form a collective unity. That's not at all what we mean by a group in mathematics. As a first approximation to what a group means, I'll tell you that a group is the collection of symmetries of some object. Here's an example. The group of symmetries of a square is illustrated in this picture. We start with a square, let's say the one here in the upper left-hand corner. I've colored the sides blue, red, black, and green so we can distinguish them. And then the picture illustrates the different symmetries. Uh, for example, we can rotate a square clockwise by 90 degrees. That's what the orange arrows indicate. So here is my square. I rotate it by 90 degrees. I do it again. I do it the third time. I do it the fourth time. And that gives me back the original square. We can also reflect a square in several ways. That's what the cyan arrows indicate. I've chosen reflection in the diagonal that goes from the upper left to the lower right. So here, if I reflect this square in that diagonal, I get this one. And once I've reflected it, I can rotate it, and so forth. So, so the, the square has eight symmetries. We count the one that does nothing. So here we have a picture of a group with eight elements in it. OK, so is that it? The collection of symmetries of some object? No, no. This has been refined and abstracted much further. What we do is we abstract away the object. So in the end, a group turns out to be a collection of things that could be the symmetries of something. And we don't care what that something might be. So here is the definition. This is the real definition of a group. So a group is a set, first of all. A set in mathematics just means a collection. There's nothing, nothing more complicated, just a plain collection of things. And there is a binary operation on this set. We can combine two elements of the set and get a third one. The idea here is that we can take two symmetry transformations, like rotations or reflections. We can do one and then the other, and that gives us a new transformation. 
And this uh, composition satisfies three properties. Here is something that we call an associative law. The next one is simply saying that there is a transformation that does nothing. And the third one is saying that every transformation can be undone. There is an inverse transformation that undoes what the transformation does. We can reflect, for example, and just reflect back. So this definition has been extraordinarily successful. This is a fantastic definition. There is a whole field of pure mathematics that is just based on this definition. It's called group theory, and group theorists, they just investigate groups. They study the things that satisfy this definition. And every year, almost 2,000 papers are published in group theory, just about the things that satisfy this definition. Okay, next, a sample proof. So I'm going to go back 2,500 years and tell you about the fact that was, um, well, is attributed to Pythagoras and his school in ancient Greece 2,500 years ago that the square root of 2 is irrational. Yep. Or, more properly said, there is no rational number there is no quotient, there is no ratio of integers whose square is equal to 2. The Greeks, uh, the Greeks thought about numbers in geometric terms. They thought of numbers as, as line segments. So here I've, whoops, here I've drawn a square. I've drawn a square and the diagonal in the square. So what the Greeks would have said is that is that the side of the square and the diagonal are not commensurable. There is no unit of length that can be used to measure both of them in the sense that both the side and the diagonal are whole multiples of this unit. So this is a wonderful fact, wonderful theorem. We talk about it at length in, in uh, second year real analysis, for example. It is as fresh and interesting as it was 2,500 years ago. Uh, there are many proofs of it, but here is one that I particularly like. I'll just explain it to you a little bit. So this is a proof by contradiction. We assume the opposite of what we are trying to prove. And then we work with that and we try to, well, get ourselves into trouble. We try to reach a contradiction. If a hypothesis leads us to a contradiction, then we're entitled to reject the hypothesis. So what we assume here then is that there is some ratio of integers whose square is equal to 2. And then there are going to be many others, you know, 2p on 2q, 7p on 7q, and maybe some others as well. And we can look at them all, and we can look at their denominators, all those q's. And we can pick the smallest one. This seems like a completely obvious thing, but this is a fundamental property of the natural numbers that, that pure mathematicians think about, think about a lot and highlight. If you have some collection of natural numbers, numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., there's going to be a smallest one. Okay, so we're entitled to choose Q to be as small as possible. But then comes a little calculation here that I won't go through in detail that produces another fraction with a smaller denominator whose square is also equal to 2. So that contradicts the choice of the original Q as the smallest possible one. That was an example of a proof. This is how pure mathematics is traditionally organized. These four subfields are, are usually mentioned as the main, main areas of, of pure mathematics. I've given a very brief description of each. Um, algebra, the mathematics of arithmetic. Geometry, the mathematics of space. These go back to the ancient Greeks. Analysis is the mathematics of time, of change. If you've done some calculus, 
This is the, this is the, the kind of mathematics where you, where you differentiate and integrate. Uh, analysis goes back at least to Leibniz and Newton in the, uh, in the 17th century, but you can find traces of it uh, back in ancient times. Topology is the most recent of the four. Um, I'm describing topology here as the mathematics of rough shape, and I will try to explain that a little bit. Topology has existed as a field in its own right for only about a century. Let me illustrate what I mean by rough shape. So on the left there, I have a nice circular ring. Then in the middle, I have, a, I have an ugly, irregular, deformed ring. But it's still got a hole through the middle. And that's all that matters. We say that, we say that these two rings have the same rough shape. And on the right-hand side, I have just a plain circle. The circle has no thickness, whereas the rings have some thickness. But the circle has that hole through the middle. That's all that matters. So these three figures have the same rough shape. It's interesting that you can make this precise. You can define very precisely what rough shape means, and then you can work with it, reason with it. Now, this division into subfields should not be taken too seriously. There is a lot of overlap and a lot of interaction between these areas, and some of the best mathematics uh, involves two or more of them. So now I'm going to turn to my own research, tell you a little bit about that. And I'm going to start by showing you one of my most recent theorems. So this is a theorem that I proved uh, in October of last year in collaboration with uh, uh, an excellent young Swedish mathematician by the name of Richard Lekkeng. Um, I was able to get him to Adelaide for six months last year, funded by my discovery grant from the Australian Research Council. And while he was here, we proved this. So here is what it says. Let y be an affine toric variety. Let s be a factorial subvariety of a reduced Stein space x, so that the natural map from hp of x comma z to hp of s comma z is surjective for p equal to 0, 1, and 2. Then every holomorphic map from s to y extends to a holomorphic map from x to y. An affine toric variety is a notion that comes from algebra. Mm -hmm. A Stein space is a geometric thing. These HPs are called cohomology groups, and they come from topology. And holomorphic maps come from analysis. So you see a little bit of, of everything in this theorem. But you also see, you also see that it's not really feasible to go into the real technical details of my research. But instead, I will try to explain some, some general themes that, that are important in my research. That will give you some of the flavor of, of what I do. I'm going to talk about differential equations. Differential equations is the core topic of analysis. Differential equations are very important in science and engineering. Every undergraduate engineering student knows something about differential equations. A differential equation gives us information about the rate of change of a quantity. How does the quantity vary? Is it changing fast, or is it changing not very much? And solving the differential equation means to determine the quantity itself from this information about its rate of change. These quantities that I'm talking about, they vary across some space. The quantity depends on a point in some space, 
And as the point varies, the quantity varies. Uh, space-time is, is a space, and just the time axis itself can also be thought of a space. So we could be looking at quantities that just vary with time as time goes on. Yeah? And there is a huge variety of spaces that pure mathematicians work with. Spaces can be curved. Here is a curved space. This is the surface of a donut. We call it a torus. Spaces can have imperfections called singularities, like this common vertex here of these two cones. If you're an amoeba living on one of the cones, you can slide around nicely with no obstructions until you hit the singularity. Something funny is going on there. You can't get through. The line is one-dimensional. The plane is two-dimensional. Our ordinary space is three-dimensional. Mathematicians work with higher dimensional spaces, four, five, six dimensional, and even infinite dimensional spaces. Here's a picture of an infinite dimensional space. My son was very surprised that I would be making a silly picture like this and putting it into a talk. But there it is. Let me, let me throw in a question that you could ask of, of so many of these concepts. Do such spaces really exist? Well, my answer is, it doesn't matter. It's still useful, it's still interesting to think about them. So the general theme in my work that I want to tell you a little bit about is how the rough shape of a space influences differential equations on the space. And I'll illustrate this by an example that has the semblance of a real world problem, sort of an application maybe, designing a landscape. So we want to design a landscape over some flat horizontal plane. So here on the, here the floor is our flat horizontal plane, and we want to design a landscape over this flat horizontal plane with, with valleys and hills and mountains and mountain passes. The easiest way to specify a landscape, of course, is just to specify the height. Let's think of that as sea level. The easiest thing is just to specify the height above sea level. But we want to do it a little bit differently. We're not interested in height, we're interested in slope. So we want to specify the slope of the landscape over every point. Now, there are two things you need to know about slope. If you're standing on a mountainside, you look in different directions, you see all different slopes. Look in this direction, it's, it's going up. Look in that direction, it's going down, and so forth. The first fact about slopes is that you can, you can work out all these different slopes if you just know two of them. Say, the eastward slope and the northward slope. So we are going to specify our landscape, the landscape we want to design, by specifying the eastward slope and the northward slope over every point in our underlying plane. And that's a pair of differential equations. So here is the picture. Uh, down here is the horizontal plane. Here is the origin in the plane. Here is the eastward axis. Um, the eastward coordinate I call x. Here is the northward axis. And I've drawn a little hill, a little part of the landscape over a portion of the plane. Here is a point down in the plane. I'll call it x, y. And here is the corresponding point in the landscape at height h. The curly d's denote rates of change. So here I'm simply saying that the eastward rate of change of height 
is the specified eastward slope. <coughs> and here I'm saying that the northward rate of change of height is the specified northward slope. I'm just setting up my problem in this way, in this, using this notation as a couple of differential equations. <coughs> now, the second fact about slope. This might surprise you. But there is a relationship between the eastward slope and the northward slope. It doesn't make sense to try to specify them independently of each other. There is a relationship between them that has to be observed for our problem to be well posed. Now what is that? Let's say I'm standing here. So I have, an, I have an eastward slope and a northward slope at every point around me. So I can move a little bit to the east and see how the northward slope changes. I can look at the eastward rate of change of the northward slope. And I can move a little bit north and see how the eastward slope changes. So I can look at the northward rate of change of the eastward slope. These are the same. They have to be the same. So the problem is not well posed unless the northward rate of change of the specified eastward slope is the same as the eastward rate of change of the specified northward slope. Okay, that's our, that's our problem that we want to solve. And now the good news is that, is that over the whole plane, the problem always has a solution. I'm always going to be able to get a landscape with the slopes that I want. Now, just, just remember that. But I'll show you a formula. If, you don't, if, if the symbols in this formula are unfamiliar to you, uh, let me just say that, that this is another aspect of mathematics that I, that I haven't really mentioned, uh, formalism. Formalism can be very powerful. Formalism is like a language. And here we have a fantastically compact and productive way to express the solution to our, our landscape problem. Yeah. Uh, these symbols here, these elongated S's, uh, these, these denote uh, what are called integrals. There is something called integration. Um, to figure out the height function that corresponds to the specified slopes, I just move around in the plane and I collect, I collect up all the little changes up or down, up or down in the height specified by the slopes and, and that gives me a solution to my problem. Okay, now, now I'm going to punch a hole in the plane. Punch a hole in the plane and thereby change its rough shape. It's not going to have a hole. I'm going to take out, say, a little disk centered at the origin of the plane. And then I claim that the landscape problem cannot always be solved. This particular, this particular problem can, in fact, not be solved. I'm saying that I want this eastward slope and I want this northward slope. Notice that um, I avoid dividing by zero in these formulas by having removed that disk from the plane, by having punched that hole. I'm not going to get into trouble by dividing by zero. If you know how to calculate rates of change, um, this is something that if you've gone through first year calculus, you'll be able to do this. You, you can see that, that my specification of slopes is consistent. Okay. The problem is well posed, but I claim that it cannot be solved. On the previous slide, I showed you that the problem could be solved by just giving you the solution. Now, how am I going to show that the problem, this problem, on the plane with a hole, cannot be solved? Well, I'm going to imagine that I have a solution 
and then I'm going to show you that something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do, so let's say here is the hole that I've punched in the plane, and now I'm standing here on the, on the, on the hypothetical landscape that I'm imagining I've got, and I'm just going to walk around the hole. I'm just going to walk around the hole in a circle like this, and if I'm on a real landscape, I'll come back to the same place. Now let's see what happens. Here I've given, okay, this is just a formula. Here I've given, a, I want to show you the calculation in case there are some people who, who would find that meaningful. Uh, here I've given a formula for this circle. So here it is. Here is, here is my plane and, and, uh, and here is the hole that I've punched and here is the red circle. I'm going to walk around the hole over this circle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the change in height as I go around the hole. If I'm on a real landscape, that change should be zero. I should just come back to the same place. If you've done a little bit of second year calculus, maybe even with first year calculus, you can work this out. This is what the calculation looks like. And you see that there is a positive non-zero change in height. As we, as we go around the hole, we actually ascend and we come back to a point that lies over where we started. The landscape that our slope assignment is trying to create is like a spiral staircase. And that's not the real landscape. And this is just because of the hole. And the exact shape of the hole doesn't matter. It's just the fact that there was that hole. So this is an example of how the rough shape of the underlying space can influence solutions of differential equations. Let me tell you a little bit more about my work. International collaboration is a significant part of the work of many academics, uh, in particular pure mathematicians. Collaboration, of course, is, is a way to accomplish things that you couldn't accomplish by yourself. And as you can imagine, collaboration, and particularly international collaboration, can be a very rewarding uh, and enjoyable part of the job. Um, the research that I'm working on right now, as in yesterday and today, is a joint project with Professor Franz Forsnerich at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And what we are looking at right now is a pair of infinite dimensional spaces. We've got two infinite dimensional spaces, one inside the other, like that. And what I've been banging my head against for a few weeks now, I'm still hoping I can, I can crack this problem, I'm trying to show that the two spaces have the same rough shape. So these spaces are quite nebulous. They, they're quite shapeless. We really don't have a very, very clear picture of them. But they do have, each space does have a well-defined rough shape that we can get a handle on and study. And I'm hoping to show that the little space is just a smaller image of the big space, roughly. This would have some very nice consequences that I, that I can't explain today. <laughs> now, we're coming to the end of the talk. I want to take the last few minutes to tell you about research in pure mathematics here at the University of Adelaide. For many years, for decades, the University of Adelaide has had a strong and active research group in pure mathematics. Not the biggest in the country, but certainly one of the strongest. 
So for about 10 years now, we resided in the School of Mathematical Sciences in happy coexistence with our colleagues in applied mathematics and statistics. At the moment, we have approximately eight regular research active staff and about the same number of researchers in limited term positions, including postdocs. And between the 16 or so of us, we have about eight major grants and fellowships, mostly from the Australian Research Council. So, so this external income more or less pays for the, for the limited term positions. Some of the grants and fellowships are held by the regular staff, but some are held by some of the outstanding young people that we've been able to attract. Uh, our research is in various areas of geometry with connections to algebra, analysis, topology, and mathematical physics. We have a strong presence in the international research community. We often travel to, to collaborate and to give invited talks at workshops and conferences. Um, we have research collaborations within Australia and in a dozen other countries. And last year, about 20 researchers from other places in Australia and overseas came to visit our group to collaborate and to, and to give talks. Finally, I want to thank my wife, Marilyn, for bringing me to Australia. I look forward to working here at the University of Adelaide for many more years. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Finna. Uh, we have some time for questions, and we have a couple of roving mics attached to very athletic people who can run up and down the room. We'd like to ask the first on the front here. Uh, thank you. Um, how much time in a given week or month would you actually spend on? Um, Say again. Uh, how much time would you spend in a given w week on helping students or, or teaching? And how much time would you spend on research? Well, typically, a typical academic spends about 40% of his or her time on research, 40% on teaching, 20% on administration and, and service. So this can vary, but that is the rough general rule. Yeah. So maybe, maybe two days out of five you can do research. In the middle here. We are recording the lecture, so it is important to get to the microphone to pose the question, and so we can hear it at the front as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an interesting lecture. Uh, having used maths all my working life, it's so uh, fascinating to see people still taking up where I left pure maths a long, long time ago. However, since pure maths is fundamental to where our society and civilization is going in the future, how many people globally would you think are actually working in this space? Oh, that's difficult to say. Um, the, the number of papers, so I mentioned earlier that, that there are 2,000 papers written per year in group theory, group theory alone, almost 2,000. Um, the total number of, of publications in well, it's mainly pure mathematics. There is maybe some applied mathematics in there as well. It's getting close to 100,000 papers per year uh, worldwide. So that gives you a rough, a rough uh, uh, measure of how many people are doing research in pure mathematics. It might be, might be something like 100,000 worldwide. Question here. As I uh, complete naive outsider. I'm just wondering, is there much cross-fertilisation between your department and, say, the DSTO, um, British Aerospace, any of those other research, uh, well, I guess not so much British Aerospace, but other research areas around particularly yeah. South Australia? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, between our school, let's say, and these areas, because, well, it's just in the nature of pure mathematics that, that applied mathematics and statistics will be more relevant to these organizations that you mentioned than, than perhaps pure. But indirectly, certainly, we, we interact with these, with these institutions. And, and in particular, many of our students, for example, students who have done honors with us, uh, go to work uh, at these institutions. So another question? There's another one down the front here. So one at the front and then we'll go. Did you mention that if you worked out that these rough shapes were identical, that they could have implications that you can't tell us about? So I, I'm, I'm leading this into the DSTO question, actually. <laughs> right, right. Well, the applications are, the applications are very, very pure. But, but let me say, well, um, let me just say very briefly that, that they, they have something to do with soap films. Uh, soap, films soap films, as you know, so let, let's say you have, a, you have a frame made of wire, okay? And you, you dip it into soapy water and lift it out, and then you get this very nice surface, okay? And there is something really special about the surface. The surface satisfies a certain geometric law. Okay? And surfaces like this are very important in geometry, and, and there is a lot of analysis around them, and so forth. And there is some connection between this funny problem about the rough shape of the infinite dimensional spaces and the geometry of soap films. So I'm, I, I, really feel, I really feel very lucky that I was able to, you know, get soap films involved. Uh, <laughs> but, but normally, you wouldn't be able to say very much to, in response to a question like that, unfortunately. OK, so we have a question two thirds back and then one third. Yes. Um, I've heard that um, it's rather difficult to come up with a profound new work past a certain age in pure mathematics. Is this true, or do you get better as you get older? <laughs> uh, better, but well, slower? Let me, um, well, well, it all depends, obviously. But let me, let me mention one thing. Another joint project that I'm involved in uh, is with uh, two mathematicians, one in Switzerland and one in the US. And the one in the US is retired, and he is getting close to uh, 70 years of age, and he is absolutely phenomenal. He is... He is doing fantastic work and, and really pulling his weight in this collaboration. So there, there are many examples of mathematicians who stay very productive at the highest level, uh, certainly into the 70s. Questions? He wanted to ask the same question, so I've got one instead. Um, Australia is moving more and more, or funding and whatever, is moving more and more in, into um, research where you can see right away um, what it does and why it's um, um, useful. Do you feel pressured by that? Well, I, I have to say that um, I think the Australian Research Council has treated pure mathematics well in recent years. I don't think the pure mathematics community can, can complain uh, about how we have fared in, in um, um, in grant applications in recent years. Uh, there, is, there, was some, there was something in the news not long ago about a relatively small amount of money being transferred from the ASC to, uh, to other kinds, I guess it was medical research. We haven't really seen how that's going to work out uh, this year in the competitions that are underway this year, but, uh, but so far it's been, it's been pretty good for pure maths. Question in the middle here. You referred to the axioms as being the building blocks. Uh, to what extent uh, is it possible that there might be new axioms that will develop, uh, open up new areas of mathematics? And to what extent uh, do you have absolute confidence in the axioms that uh, are historic? I understand that in quantum mechanics or in quantum computing, uh, some of the axioms are a bit uh, dubious. Yeah, the, the, axioms, the axioms that I mention, mentioned 
Um, I mean, they were not pulled out of a hat. They developed over many years, and they have now been tested over many years, and, and, they, have, and they have proved themselves to, uh, to really reflect uh, what mathematicians expect. They, 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 really seem to, they really seem to encompass what they're intended to, uh, to encompass. Um, there is always the possibility of investigating new approaches, new, new kinds of mathematics. Uh, but so far, just about everything, everything that mathematicians have tried or found fruitful uh, can actually, does actually fit into this, into this framework. So maybe, maybe what we're talking about here is that you know, mathematics really is not, it's not just a game with symbols based on arbitrary actions. There is really, there is really much more to it, much more to it than that. There is, there is something, th the mathematics we do, we do for a reason. It's somehow natural, has evolved over a very long time, and these actions have been very carefully chosen um, to, to reflect what we want them to reflect. It's not that the actions came first and then the mathematics. The actions were chosen so as to produce, to provide uh, a secure foundation for the mathematics that we were doing anyway. Um, I think we've got time for two more questions, one at the front and then one at the very back. Um, <coughs> I've actually got two questions. <laughs> uh, just one, please. Um, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that the number two was in your head. Uh, in your op opinion, do you discover or do you invent your maths? Yeah, that's a good question. Do we discover maths or do we invent it? Um, I think, now, maybe I should say first that um, there is such a thing as the philosophy of mathematics. The philosophy of mathematics is a, is a, is a big and very active area within philosophy. And, and to tell you the truth, uh, most mathematicians know very little about it and don't really care. Uh, <laughs> The, the tiny bit, uh, now I'm not one of those, I, I find it interesting. Um, but um, so, so, so the, the tiny bits of sort of philosophical comments that I made in this talk uh, are, are sort of very down to earth layman's philosophy, uh, a working mathematician's philosophy. And I think, I think the truth is that, that um, well, I, I would even venture to say all mathematicians, to all mathematicians, certainly the vast majority of them, it's a bit of both. You, you, um, you have a feeling that these objects somehow exist outside of yourself, independently of you. So you, are, uh, you have the feeling sometimes that you're discovering something that was already there. But sometimes you have the feeling that you're actually inventing something brand new that didn't exist before. It, it, really, is, it really is a bit of both. And at the back. Yeah, fa fascinating talk, thank you. What inspired you to get into mathematics in the first place? Oh, that's, that's a very difficult question. Why does someone get interested in something and not something else? Um, the only, well, maybe it's just the way I am, you know. Just, but the, the only direct influence that I can think of uh, was my father. He, he taught me mathematics at home from an early age. Um, that's, that's got to have been an influence on me. And, and that meant that by the time I, I, I entered high school, I, I had decided that I wanted to be a mathematician. The, the decision was made, already made then. And, and that's the only direct influence I can, I can think of. Thank you, Finna. Um, I explained the view within the School of Mathematical Sciences here that Finner is well, not well regarded for his enthusiasm and clarity. He then declared at the beginning of his talk that it was going to be inaccessible. <laughs> I, I don't think he proved that. Um, indeed, the concept of assuming that you have a solution and then proving you don't has, in, for me, a horrid familiarity. <laughs> um, so while some of the details of his work are obscure, Finner has conveyed a great deal about the concepts of pure mathematics and the true appeal that the discipline has. And for me, the, the cultural significance within our society, which is why I believe ARC continues to fund it, irrespective of the fact it may take 100 years before Finna's work is truly 
uh, finding an application, uh, perhaps even sooner. So I hope you'll join me again in thanking Finna while I give him a, a small gift. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It just leaves me to finish by letting you know about our next Research Tuesdays event. Next month, unsurprisingly, we will recognize the centenary of the Anzac Gallipoli landing, and three of our researchers will join together in a forum to discuss some of the legacies of the landing. So if you're interested, please register and join us on Tuesday the 14th of April. The details are on the university website, of course. Thank you all again for coming, and good night.